Good afternoon or good morning, disaster and emergency management leaders. Uh, my name is Brad Eisen with Hazardscape. Thank you for tuning in to, to uh, today's Hazardscape live episode. We're live broadcasting on LinkedIn and Facebook on our page. And in just a few moments, I'm going to introduce CEO Brian McKinney from Isoft, Isoft Technologies and Voyant Alert. Uh, Brian was uh, gracious enough to come on today and talk about building trust in your emergency alert system. He has, I, like I said, he's been around the block in technology for the majority of his, for all of his career, really. He graduated from the University of Victoria with a, a bachelor's of science with physics and mathematics, and he has a master's in engineering. He's worked at Nortel. He's developed technology companies, sold technology uh, companies, and, and has developed and commercialized over 60 consumer products. So we are going, you, you're you going to have an opportunity to hear from a, a technology expert who's been in the sector for, for uh, over 25 years. So if you're interested in technology, emergency alerting, emergency management, stay tuned for this. It's, it's going to be fantastic. And what we've got coming up on Hazardscape Live over the next couple of months is really exciting. I'm working with uh, Ket, uh, Ken Letander. We're going to talk Indigenous policy around emergency management and, and his role within the in Indigenous community across Canada. We're going to talk to public speaking author, uh, public speaking for dummies author, Alison Connolly. We I'll be on live with her doing some warm ups and public speaking exercises and, and talking about that. So don't miss that. We're going to talk about uh, briefings in the emergency operations center and how to reduce some of your anxiety when you've got to stand up in front of a field team or an EOC team. Then we're going to be uh, talking to Autism Canada about neurodiversity and and the evacuation center and with evacuees and how that impacts. And then I'll be doing a solo show coming up on uh, coaching for executives and senior leaders uh, and, and talking a little bit about that. So we are going to get started and uh, right now. Welcome, Brian McKinney. I just saw you doing some uh, some mouth stretches, mouth exercises there to get warmed up. There you go. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Brad. Certainly appreciate the opportunity to chat. Yeah, you're welcome. I really appreciate, like I said before we started, I really appreciate Lauren reaching out and and wanting to to get us together to do this because I think. Uh, you know, with with the pandemic over the last 16 months, and I've talked a little bit about this, you know, I, I talked about, you know, the emergency alert systems for the pandemic and whether or not we should be using them. And, you know, we we saw, I, I don't know, I don't want, I didn't want to go into any political things, but we, a, a province that I'm familiar with, you know, issued an emergency alert uh, almost a year into the pandemic. And, and there was a lot of talk and discussion about that. So lots, lots to talk about around building trust with your emergency alert system. So thank you. Yeah. So where, where do we start? Because this is a, like, it's a process. Building trust is a process. So where do you start in that process as far as starting to have that initial conversation and, and starting to build that trust? So it, it, it starts when we first start to engage the municipalities one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think you, you, you suggested it there. We view trust as, as, as a life cycle issue throughout your relationship with the community and, and their constituents um, and through the life cycle of each alert. Um, as we started, you know, we've been around for a while, as, as, as you identified, uh, we kind of came out of the IT sector, uh, dealing with corporations and whatnot, where, you know, they control their their, their communities, their local communities. Yeah. Um, as we moved into the public sector, um, 
one of the things that really draw drew our attention was if, if you think back a couple of years ago, you remember the California wildfires? Oh yeah, yeah. Was going on. Yeah. So there was an interesting after action report there that that was really cool, and they studied. And they were trying to get down to the root cause of the question, which is why were so few people enrolled in right. the emergency systems that they had? And what came back was just lack of trust. They just didn't, they either didn't have confidence that the information they were going to get was relevant or that the information they were putting into the system wasn't going to be abused and, and used in some other way. So, um, you know, we start, we started from, from the ground up at that point, building the whole environment around structuring that trust and building on it yeah and and those and those after action reports like those you know what we get it to the public what what's released to the public is actually you know what's been massaged through government and bureaucracy <laughs> yeah. and co and communications people so i i've got a, a a personal friend who you know his life mission is to get the first draft of every after action report ever created so he, so he can read about what what was really said so I, yeah. I i just throw that out there um just because anytime someone brings up after action report i like to kind of throw that in there but the absolutely that i remember that now that you say that that was a big a big issue so when when you you know as a ceo as a technologist and emergency alert when you read an after action review like that what what do you do or what does your company do to kind of analyze them and and incorporate solutions or new ideas so we were fortunate in that we were in the middle of our initial development cycle at the time okay. for the for the for the service set so we we digested that data and really let it inform us in terms of how we wanted the product to look at and some of the key takeaways were you know people were very uncomfortable having to put names into their system and associate right. that with addresses or, or whatnot and it, you know we asked ourselves do we really need names? If, if we're if we're just passing out information, it, it slows down the registration process. Um, you know, is, there's a lot more value in terms of stimulating registration by by keeping it anonymous. And, oh, and so, so really reducing the amount of information you take, like you're only yeah. gathering what you what you really need. That's right. So every okay. piece of information we looked at bringing into the system, we questioned whether or not, is it absolutely necessary? Okay. And, you know, depending on the circumstances, perhaps it's yes, and, and others it's no, but we always defaulted to that to that privacy space in terms of, of, of what we were doing. Um, the other thing that we found was really interesting was, was the people that eventually got the notifications out of California. Yeah. Most of them were, were coming in from, from a referral from a friend. So somebody would get the alert, and then they'd phone up or they'd forward it along. And so we built a lot of our um, downstream communication model yep. around that. So if you have the app, you can you can post it to your social media channels, your 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 Slack chat or or, or email or, or text messages, whatever. Um, and, and 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 you know the, it, the critical point is getting that information out by whatever channel is is available to you. Okay, so you you incorporate. Uh, other channels like slack yeah well i mean what we do is we allow the recipients to promote the alerts that they're receiving through any of their social media channels so any of their social be it, okay be, be, be it slack be it facebook be it twitter okay. what, what have you and we certainly support those channels ourselves from an administrative output point of view yeah yeah uh, but but if you wanted to get that viral action during a critical event allowing your community and your constituents to to push it out to their contacts really helps amplify the message um, yeah absolutely and and if and if you're just joining us we're talking to ceo brian mckinney from voyant alert so if you've got questions or comments uh if you're on linkedin and i i can see the comments if you're if you're commenting from facebook we won't be able to but throw in any questions or comments so having okay so i think over the last 16 months for example slack has has skyrocketed in terms of users so because i think correct me if i'm wrong you do alert emergency alert systems for corporations businesses as well do you yeah, do, you do sure that do. yeah yep. so ha having having the ability for a company to put an alert through a slack do you do discord do you do discord you know the gamer 
Do you yeah, guys we, do we, that we, one yet? Yeah, we don't do that one yet. No, <laughs> but we, actually, but but we we've, we've certainly been tracking that that venue as yeah, as okay. Camp, um, in terms of, of where where it's going to, there were again some interesting reports that talked about you know how do you tap into some of that the gaming channels that, that, that are yeah. out there. Cause that, so, that would be, uh, that, that would be pretty cool. But yeah. So if you're listening, like, yeah, Slack K that's, that's good to know because I never, uh, you, when I, when I always think social media, I'm like Twitter, Facebook. Yeah. And uh, we do May, those, right? Yeah, you do those. Those are kind of the, yeah. the usual suspects, but the other ones, I never, I never really thought of Slack in that as, as that use. You know, so that's pretty cool. It's like Slack. We're onboarding Microsoft teams right now. Um, oh, okay. You know, um, Active Directory kind of technologies. Um, yeah, all, all really important, and that that tends to be more in the industrial, the corporate domain. Sure. Um, yeah. In in the public sector, um, you know, one of the, the things we really wanted to focus on was how do you get people to pay attention, and so yeah. um, things like uh, well, we just wanted to make sure the relevance levels were high. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of where it is. So a lot of geo-targeting, a lot of geofencing, that sort of stuff is is where we, we we kind of decide to focus on. Go go okay. So what is um what is geofencing? So geofencing allows you to target a neighborhood or a region um, yeah. for for action or, or or in our case alert delivery. So you know maybe it's it's a simple matter as is drawing a picture on a map. Uh, you know, that says I want to talk to these six houses or these okay. 30 houses or these 50 houses. Um, and then the message will go out to those specific individuals that have a location registered in that space. What it allows us to do is to kind of filter out information that's unwanted to the non-recipient. So if you're living in the south end of the city and there's a water, water outage at the north end of the city, yep. you know, our, our concern was that if, if you're if you're if you're having if you're the guy with the water outage, you want to hear about it and hear yep. about when it's going to be corrected. But if you're at the south end of the city, this is just noise, and and the question is is how do we eliminate that that noise? So right. we wanted to build up the relevance in that system, um, in order to to target those more directly. Um, right. The same sort of thing with the nature of different alerts. We we allow, for example, the ability to import map files, say oh, yeah. for a uh, say for a hundred year floodplain. Sure. And, you know, one of the things that we noticed with some of our earlier alerts was the level of anxiety that that was created where if, if you were on one of the boundaries of the floodplain yeah. and, and your neighbor got an alert, but you didn't, that drew into question the veracity of the system. Sure. Why, why did Frank get it and, 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 and not me. me? Yeah. And so a lot of the best practices we developed kind of structured around how do you expand that communication window in, in a tiered approach so okay. that you know critical critical alerts went to these folks because they had to get out and then more informational structured alerts went to people that were maybe at a slightly greater distance from the event that okay, yeah. informed them of what was going on proximal to them okay um, and and we found that that reduced the anxiety and the demand significantly and, and we chose to measure that by the support calls coming in so oh, you know, okay, we had sure. one of those original uh, alerts, you know, we had very few support calls coming in from the evacuation zones. Yeah. But the perimeter is where all the support calls were coming in. And, you know, once we started to structure a tiered or a stack level alert, that, that resolved the issue quite, quite considerably. So, okay. So let's, let's say I'm, uh, and I, I, I might bring this up and it, we might want to use an example because I know you guys just finished or are in the process of working with the district of Tofino, which is of personal interest to me because I, I've, I'm i from Sydney, BC. Like I, w I grew up in Sydney, BC. So uh, going to Tofino has been a an annual event for my family and I. That's where I proposed to my wife. That's like Tofino is our, is our and I and I always bug uh, if you if you know her she used to be the mayor there for a while but now she's the minister uh, Josie Osborne I would always bug her on Facebook about being prepared for tsunamis and like what is, what are they doing so and now that you you guys just are working with the district what if I'm an emergency manager in a small community we don't have an alert a system 
of, of our own or, you know, I don't know if there is any like this or if, if we're not on a provincial hooked into the provincial system, like what should I be preparing for in terms of taking on a project? Like I've, I've pitched it to my council. They, they like the idea, you know, now it's time to reach out to you. Where does it start? So one of the things that, so it starts with the outreach. And, and yeah. basically, we, we we will walk that prospective client through the, the, the process. We we do a lot of listening, trying to understand okay. exactly what their primary areas of concern are and whether or not yeah. we can address them or not. Um, and in our case, we elected to focus more on smaller to medium-sized communities. Uh, okay. as, as you know, you're, you're in the space. There's a lot of great solutions out there. Yep. They tend to be slanted a little bit towards more urban centers. So we kind yep. of took the position of let's focus on a slightly different need set and, right. and call it small to medium sized communities. Yeah. Um, in the case of something like Tofino, it was very simple. I mean, tsunamis. So what yeah, is it that big. people have to <laughs> big is, issues and big events? Well, and huge um, tour, like, and massive tourism in the summer. So people yeah. that aren't familiar with a tsunami, uh, they're they're coming there for the first time. They're on a beach, like I I remember seeing the huge tsunami sirens yeah. out on the beaches that they test. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So one of the things, the first thing we wanted to do was to make sure that um, the visitors, the residents, were getting accurate information. So we chose to import a bunch of the the, the district's lidar charts for very detailed oh. elevation maps around the wow. district. Okay. Um, and, you know, if, if you're familiar with tsunamis and some of the risk, some of the threats that people face is that when you put out these generic alerts, everybody packs the roads and nobody can move. Mm. And in, in reality, the, it's the people that are in the inundation zones that you want to get out. Mm -hmm. And the people that are above the high water mark, you really want them to stay sheltered in place. Mm -hmm. So we, what we did was we were able to construct a series of, of alert templates for them that would identify, you know, different messages to different group sectors. So if you're below the 20 meter mark, you're gonna get the message, get out of, get out to high ground. If you're above, you're, you're being told to shelter in place. Because of the way this, our system is developed, we can show people where they are relative to the high ground. And so oh, they yeah, can okay. look and say, oh look, the 20 meter mark, we gotta to get to that point over there, 100 meters away. Um, and, and that can be reflected either on their cell phone or, or sure. just, you know, through, through visual indicators. Okay. Um, especially if you're new in town, if you're a visitor yeah. or something like that, you may not know where the emergency shelters are. Absolutely. So having it pop up on your phone, here are the turn-by-turn -turn instructions to get to that emergency shelter. You know, if you're a resident, you know where the community hall is. If yes. you're a visitor, you might not. So it's those little things. And, and what we found was that adding that context, while, while it may be a small element, is really really important to building trust and, yeah and that, more, it's more, that localization yeah. it's it's kind yeah. of like that localization idea Co yeah. companies that want to export into china or other countries need to localize their yeah. language and that actually when you said that the the immediate i had this thought in my head this picture in my head because when i was working in high river during the 2013 floods we had one of our disaster recovery offices set up at the local school board, like the town of High River. Uh, I think it was the teacher's school board office. Mm -hmm. And so when you told the community, come to the you know, town of High River or the local school board office, everyone was like, what? So yeah. we, had to change, we had to change our messages to the, the log cabin by the mini golf course. Yeah, and, and yeah. you know, so when we when we built out our system, we made sure that we could drop the little circle around the little log cabin that we wanted people to go to. Yeah. And then link it to a Google Maps interface that people are more comfortable with sometimes with, with conventional turn by turn instructions from their current location to where that location is. So, oh, okay. you know, so cool. sometimes there's you know there, there can be a lot of information that you want to convey. Um, you yeah. just have to make sure it's relevant back to that point of trust. And, and 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 simple um uh, you know a lot of times personalized information is critical Whoops. to uh to developing that yep um so you know in the event of things like fires and and gas leaks and whatnot um 
if we know where the gas leak is and we know where a monitored location like a home or a school might be, yeah. we can be very precise. We can say your child's school that you've elected to monitor is located 200 meters northwest of the gas leak. They're evacuating the school. Here's the pickup location that you wow. need to drive to, to to pick up your child. That that level of precision feeds into that trust uh, building kind of repertoire or exercise. Yeah, absolutely. So you're, you're, as I heard you say at the start, you're coming in to listen to the community. That's, you know, that's, that's one of the best ways to, to develop trust is just to listen and really get an understanding of their needs. But then you're also within the software functionality, the hardware functionality, you're incorporating solutions or, or small systems to, to do that. Yeah, we want to deliver as much contextual information as possible to the recipients okay. Okay. On, on that one. And, and, you know, I think when you mentioned Lauren, when she was talking to you earlier, um, it, it's really important to recognize that one size doesn't fit all. Um, yeah. some, of these, some of these communities might be skewed towards a very um, tech-friendly audience and, and, yeah. and, 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 and resident demographic. Um, others, others might skew more towards a retirement demographic and they might right. have other needs so that the information they're getting and digesting may not be in a mobile app form. It may be in a voice call coming to their landline. And, and I think you need to adapt the service dynamically to accommodate that. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know about yourself, but, but two things that really frustrate me when you get those voice calls. One is when they start talking about visual aids that obviously you're not <laughs> going to see in a voice call. Yes. Uh, you know, so we need yeah. to make sure that, that we're not sending those kinds of confusing messages in terms of how the voice calls are structured. Yeah. Um, an another example is um, when you get the automated voice call and it's mispronouncing local names or local right. community names. Yeah. You know, um, then all of a sudden the attention immediately shifts from where it should be on, on the instant to they mispronounce, you know, to come say wrong or, or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we do things like try to incorporate a phonetic library into our, our audio call out so that you can tailor the pronunciation so that we don't get that level of confusion in, in and around the community members. Yeah, no, absolutely. And th uh, thanks for that comment, Pauline. Uh, I remember w working at Alberta Emergency Management Agency we when we first started with the alberta emergency alert system that was the number one phone call and complaint we got was you didn't say my community correct <laughs> and, and, and that's it was yeah. we that's where my our our assistant deputy minister spent more more time dealing with those complaints than actual functioning of the system to save lives yeah and and it, it's just a reality. I mean, people yeah. focus on, on, on that. And, and what we need to do is make sure that people's, are attention, people's attention are where you want it to be, which is on the instant, on the instructions, things that will pull them in and engage them. And um, a lot of times the personalization information that we put in there may not be particularly relevant, but what it does is it, it wakes people up and, yeah. and it gets them to focus on uh, very directly um, the, the, the nature of the event. So. Yeah, and and so, well, and, and guess what the second the second call was uh, from uh, after an emergency alert test. the The second call was you interrupted my show. Yeah. Uh, when we did it on TV or whatever like that. So, uh, absolutely, there are people in the community that will. That's what they're going to remember yeah. after a first. Te you roll out a new system. The first test, you interrupted my TV show. You didn't say my community name right. Uh, whatever it is, like it's it's yeah, yeah. that's that's and, tough. And that erodes the trust. So you yeah. go back to that trust theme again. You you can go to great lengths to to build that trust, and you do that by respecting anonymity, you add context, personalize the message as much as you can. You know, in that sense, but it can all evaporate instantly with a bad. Uh, a bad piece of information, you know, yeah, talking to uh, one absolutely. segment and not talking to another people that yeah. are on that boundary line. 
Yeah, and and so if you're just joining us, we're we're on live right now with CEO Brian McKinney from iSoft Technologies Voyant Alert, talking about how to build trust in your emergency alert system. Throw us a comment or a question if if you've got one, we'll be happy to take it. Let let's talk a little bit about you know message fatigue because I think you know there there I don't know on a global level how many communities or countries used their alert system for the pandemic, but I think there is a risk there that if you were going to use it often, that message fatigue could have set in. So tell us a little bit about how you have that conversation with communities and, and kind of what you advise and how you work with that. So, you know, our advice sometimes runs contrary to, to sometimes some of the first responders' perception of, of how it runs. Um, when we first started, um, we had a lot of communities tell us we're just exclusively going to use this for emergency alerting. And, and we, we totally respect that view. But then as we started to see the data, what we saw was that those communities that were engaging in more of a day-to-day -day response um, on, on a responsible manner. So, so the information they were using, using targeted geofencing. So, so everybody who got a notification, they got it because it was relevant to them or, or important to them. Um, we noticed that those communities that were using it in a responsible fashion were generating a much higher level of enrollment, you know, five to seven times more than, than those communities that were using it exclusively for emergency alerting, which, you know, caught us a little bit by surprise, but, you know, we were, we were certainly happy for the, for the data. So when, when it came time for COVID, one of the things that we had the conversations with our communities about was cautioning against overuse. Um, and, you know, communities on, on the COVID-related side of the equation were, were primarily keeping it for, you know, an initial alert about parks and, 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 and healthy behavior and keeping your distance. And then more updates that went out were more around facility hours. So town hall is open. Uh, we're taking this action. So we're deferring your taxes. You can now pay this way or this, that way. Again, very germane information, but not that, that were regarding municipal changes that were driven by COVID at different points in time during the pandemic cycle. Um, yeah. You know, as, as tax season is coming up, we're going to do taxes this way because of COVID. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't a real onslaught. Um, we saw and and you know, so Atlantic Canada, uh, Newfoundland, we saw some of the most creative and fabulous alerts going out and, and ideas about driving community engagement through the whole pandemic. Okay. We have a, a bunch of communities there that that were doing totally fabulous things. And, you know, at first we weren't sure uh, how effective they would be, but they consistently kept driving their, their user base up. And, wow. and you know, the, the quality of the alerts was very high and very engaging. Um, they were They were booking a drive-in theater Really, um, every Friday night for for community drive-in events, so that they could still maintain social distancing, but yeah. it was a way to get people engaged and brought together. And they were using the Boeing Alert system to to broadcast that out. Wow! Um, when we have a informational channel, we allow people to opt in or opt out. So it's not like if it's an informational alert and you don't want to hear about town council comings and goings, you yeah. click a button and, and you won't be bothered by it. But what we saw was that in this kind of this event where it was very community centric and very engaging, it 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 it, it just climbed. It was it was really effective. Wow. Well, and I mean, and and there's always that perception, like you know, Atlantic Canada is a very like there there are not you know many more much more friendlier group of people yeah. or communities, <laughs> right? Like my dad grew up in New Brunswick. And just all, all the time. And, and so it doesn't surprise me that that would kick in, that that type of community response would kick in. And they're very used to big emergencies. Like I remember a friend of mine uh, from out east, he, you know, he'd tell me all the time, like the, the one of the big things, everyone, if there is a power outage or a storm coming, everyone would fill up their bathtubs with water. Like that was like the first thing they do. So 
doesn't doesn't surprise me at all that to hear to hear about that and and so Shelly thanks for commenting yes uh I will be posting there will be a full interview of of this through our YouTube channel and it, it'll come out uh on LinkedIn uh Pauline it's a great strategy to create uh, familiarity to use our system absolutely great examples of what relevancy looks like for various communities and that's I think something I don't know if emergency managers in a community are a hundred percent conscious of the fact that when they develop their alert system, it's a system for their community. They're just not getting an off the shelf solution that, you know, Edmonton might use or Vancouver might use. They're getting support from you and your experience and, and everything you bring to the table with decades of experience to develop something right for their community. Yeah, every account is customized. Okay. So every account has the ability to brand the, the service to their yeah. to their own community. Um, sometimes we have clusters of communities with shared emergency response actions. Um, okay. And and so we we go to great efforts to support that kind of an overlap amongst communities. Yeah. Um, a lot of this is possible, I think, because our target audience tends to be small to medium, kind of that rural sector. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure how well some of these strategies would play necessarily or translate into a large urban deployment. Right. You know, um, in, in that case, the drive-in theater example might totally flop. Um, yeah. But it, it, you know, it, it, as it was suggested, you know, you got to play to your audience on, 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 on some of those and, and get away with it. Um, and you, you know, to your point with your dad, yeah, I mean, that's the way people were brought up, and, and that's and, just the way. React. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we we do see a lot of that. Yeah. So where, okay, so going through that process of of again building trust with with your alert system. I mean, I would imagine communities like they do all they can to kind of advertise and promote the system, but what are some other strategies that, that you know of that communities are taking that are working really well in terms of increasing enrollment? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I imagine a lot of small towns, you know, there's people walking into the, the, the town office off the street mm -hmm. with questions. Um, do you, do you, I mean, I imagine you guys provide staff training to the community all that yeah we yeah we do we do um we do a bunch of stuff as, as, as we're yeah. onboarding a community uh, you know one of the things we recognize is a lot of these places the, the the staff members are often holding two or three jobs you know they're wearing multiple hats um so we need to take that into account our training is very you know 90 minutes uh we have specialized front line staff training that that instructs them on most of the frequently asked questions and how to do it our staff sits in behind. Um, we act in a surge capacity. So if if the frontline staff have questions that they can't answer, or maybe they're getting inundated, or it's a busy day, um, we're there to kind of act as a buffer for them, so they can just automatically offload some of those those queries onto us, and rather than than you know struggle through them themselves. Um, Ninety nine percent of the time, it's just providing assistance to different parts of the demographic to get enrolled or, or, or how do I get this set up if, if they're having difficulty or maybe they lack internet access. Um, so we, we, we act in a, in a support role to those communities and in and around that. Each of their uh, templates are customized. They all have, uh, you know, shelters and, and areas where they want to specify um, on that one. In terms of getting the word out, we've had some communities put up posters on buses. Um, oh, yeah. You know, um, not sure how effective that was, but it, 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 that was one of the things that, that, that worked. The, the most effective is sometimes just the simplest. And for, for smaller communities, the thing that, that's worked brilliantly, and, and it came to us as a suggestion from, it came to us from Tofino. Oh, okay. No <laughs> surprise. Thinking about it there. Um, what works really effectively for, for the smaller communities is business cards. So okay. you know, the, the town offices have a brochure, but what we do is, right, what we do now is we send each of our clients a stack of a thousand business cards, yeah. point alert, this is how you log in, this is kind of three bullet points, what it does, and they're, they're, they're handed out at the grocery stores, at the, at the checkout 
till oh, like and the little cards. Yeah. Yep. It's just dropped in the bag. And, oh. and, and that's probably been one of our most effective ways of disseminating um, information at, 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 at that point. We've had fire chiefs host events, go to door. That all works. But at, at the end of the day, it, it, it was the business cards in, in, in the co-ops that, that worked really well. Um, that's pretty cool. Using the system, using the system generates the most registrations. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, after an event or after a test alert, you, every community will see it spike up. Um, yeah, sure. On, on that. Huh. That that's actually kind of cool because you know that's that's it's a non-technology solution to you know what what's you know a technology issue. And it's, you know, it's not expensive to print out a business card. And again, you know, and, and Tofino's that kind of community, like, and that was going to be my question, actually. So, yeah, rural, remote, isolated communities. Uh, my mother-in-law lives in Elnora. I go there. Uh, she, like, my cell phone does not work. She would not get an emergency alert if she was in her house on her on her cell phone. Are you, are you seeing in Canada... Like that shift where the smaller rural remote communities are getting better internet access, and like, are you seeing any trends? Yeah, we we are, and it it came up as a bit of a surprise to us. Um, one of the things that we didn't recognize that you know, in, in hindsight, we probably should have. Um, even if the smaller communities up north, um, First Nation communities, or or or, or otherwise, um, have poor cell coverage, they often will have great Wi-Fi coverage. So our alerts will happily deliver uh, over over Wi-Fi, and and you can receive them on your cell phone, yeah. Just just as, as a Wi-Fi alert coming in into the mobile apps, and so uh, we have dozens of, of northern communities that have no cell service that are yeah. VoIP alert clients that are just reliant on uh, on on Wi-Fi networks. On Wi-Fi, oh, okay. Well, in Elnora, and, if you want good Wi-Fi, you've got to go sit in front of the library in your in your car. <laughs> So yeah. it's kind of funny, but uh, yeah. okay, that, that's a good point. Um, and so, yeah, like somebody, I'm sorry, I don't know who the LinkedIn user is because their their account might be set up a little funny, but they're saying, you know, what about information table and having people sign in up on site? Absolutely. When I when I worked for the federal government, I I had to like my job was to go to indigenous communities across Western Canada. Um, at the time, luckily I was younger and very naive because I was in a role where we were issuing a gun, like their, their firearms license test. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not a lot of indigenous communities were happy that we were having, that the federal government was making them get a license for their, their long gun. But anyway, I spent a ton of time and I went, I don't remember what community it was. It, it might've been in Bella Coola. Like they put us in a shed uh, with a table and they had a TV camera and a satellite dish. And the guy that I was traveling with all day, we just sat and got broadcasted to the community's TV station. And <laughs> like people would come in, they fill out their application, you know, like I'd say, hey, come down to the shed and come, come fill out your application. But that's mm -hmm. that type of local community solution to communication right that going into that community you might not even know that exists until you're there they might not even know to tell you no right? that's right yeah and you know to the to the gentleman who or, or lady who, who made the suggestion with the list we use those all the time sure um in, in terms of what we do the one thing we have to be careful with is is to make sure that when we are registering on people's behalves we do so in a manner that's compliant with the privacy legislation in Canada right. and, and and the provinces, and we do that using something called dual factor authentication. Okay. So yeah. if, if you say you say you you signed the list and you wanted it and you wanted to receive a text on your on your phone, I can register you, but then what's going to happen is you're going to get a text on your phone saying, "So and so has been trying to register you for the Boeing Alert System. Are you okay with that?" So we have to yeah. get that handshake, that confirmation there, but. Um, to your point on TV and, and the broadcast, you don't, you often don't know what tools you have to facilitate registration until you get into the community itself. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. You know, sometimes we've attended community hall meetings where we just sat there and just walked it through. We have our tablets and we just mass register people. Okay. Uh, we've gone into retirement homes where we do the same thing. Um, you know, up, up in that, um, you know, in Parksville, Qualicum Beach, uh, kind of central part of the island there, um, they did a lot of registration that way. Um, yeah, and and that's like that's what I like about the field of emergency management because, it, like in the smaller communities and the bigger ones too, you you are a very centralized function within the community. Like you get you you've got a, you've got all these different touch points, and and I know like in emergency management, uh, you know, looking at preparedness and plans and and past events, like you go to your local museum. You co talk to elders in the community or seniors about, you know, what what was it like growing up here? What was the weather like? What were some, you know, big hazards that you noticed that maybe aren't happening so much? So uh, it's 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 great to hear that when you're developing an emergency alert system, you're you're taking that community approach. Yeah. Right. I think we and forget that again. Yeah. No, it, and it just needs to be drilled down. Sometimes it will be the elder generation that that's the stimulus and the driving force and sometimes it's going to be the younger generation that that's doing it for their parents or their grandparents um in terms of getting them registered um on on that and it it, it works so long as you're very respectful of people's time and their privacy um, and that the alerts are going out are, are really consistent in terms of of their purposefulness and and whatnot i think I think it, it builds on itself. Um, we certainly, you know, we have the cadre of, of social media promotions and stuff like that that, that reach a certain segment of, of the community. And they yeah. work very effective. They are very effective at, at driving that, that engagement and enrollment. Um, you know, others get it by referrals from friends or family. So when you do forward one of our alerts, if, if I were to receive an alert and forward it to you, you would get that alert. And then you would right. have a little button at the bottom of that alert with a, here's how you can register if you want to get them directly yourself. Okay. So we, we rely on that, that referral propagation quite a bit. Okay. What, so, and, and again, we talked a little bit about this before the episode. Uh, when we did our, our virtual open house, you had an opportunity to, to come into the Hazardscape virtual hub, which is a virtual reality based platform uh, put out there by Verbella. And, and so, you know, you as a technology expert who's been in, in technology for a while and, and going into virtual reality and seeing all these things, like, what are you, th what are you thinking is next for emergency alert systems in the next decade? Like, is there going to be like a major shift in something or is it going to be kind of slow? What, what are you thinking? I, I think there's going to, you're going to see trends towards privacy, towards more anonymity, privacy. And, and more context. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we need to overcome some of the negative perceptions about some of the mobile apps. Yeah. I know there's a lot of concern that, that people have that, oh, the mobile app for the system might be tracking my location. And in our case, as a, as a small company, nothing can be farther from the truth. We, we want to send you down the alert details and have your phone decide itself whether it's in or out we have no desire or ability practically speaking to to to, to track you know a million people at, at, at once or, or or what have you um on that one um but but we need to move in a direction that increases context respects the privacy and and gets people comfortable uh with that, that the information they're going to get is, is, is of relevance to, to, to the circumstance. Yeah, okay, um, so that's interesting. Okay, keep going, sorry. Um, I was going to say the, the virtual experience that you identified? Yeah. Tremendous. Um, cool. we're, we're, we're seeing variants of that with um, integrating to drones. So when you're in an emergency oh, yeah. management, there's, there's going to be a situation where drone coverage might provide, you know, greater facility. To, yep. to communicating information, um, evacuation route planning, uh, oh, yeah. and a lot of the a lot of the the drive BC. Sometimes you are going to funnel down, like in the 
like in the fires in northern Alberta, there's one way in, one way out, and it's yeah. unavoidable. Yeah. But in other circumstances, in other communities, there might be um, other pieces of information. Um, when we talk about context, a lot of it is is plugging into Internet of Things and right. and local local instrumentation. So when we talk about next generation alerting, say there's a gas leak um, at a or a train derailment. You know, one of the things that's of relevance is which way is the wind blowing, right? And that that's going to to dictate your alert evacuation zones. You know, based on on how strong is the wind, how how fast is the gas dissipating. A lot of that we can now automate and and provide more informed um, alerts automatically for for first responders that are on on scene. Yeah, that that's yeah. The Internet of Things is a good point. I was also kind of thinking. You know how how does machine intelligence, you know, play start to play a part in this? Uh, b- because it's, you know, there there's there's like with alerting, there's a lot of data. I I, yeah. I would think like there you can you can if you choose to, and, and then when you say the the Internet of Things, like you can bring in a ton of data, which is what's really needed to have good artificial intelligence, and. I mean, but then again, there's the privacy thing, and I could only imagine some communities being told that, yeah, you sign up for this, and your data is being used to feed an artificial intelligence. I mean, the you know the next alert they think will be the robot apocalypse, which is you know not not true at all. But uh, there's a lot of things at play there for sure that that emergency alerting can tap into. There is, and and some is going to live, raise the bar. You know, um, yeah. machine learning, there, there's a lot you can do, but to your point, it can be controversial. Right, you know, yeah. Rightfully, rightfully or wrongfully, but, but you know, are you misappropriating people's information? And, yes. And, and that's, you know, it, 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 it's an issue that we need to be very conscious of. As a company, as so as a technologist, I'm fascinated by the prospects of machine learning and, and, and how we yeah. can apply that to, to solving problems. From a practical point of view as a company, we've decided not to go down that path at, yep. at present. So we do not yep. repurpose. We don't aggregate the information. We're, 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 we're staying away from that one. I think, I think we kind of want to go back to fundamentals, which is we're promising this and we need to be respectful of this. So that, that, yeah. you know, we're not doing that now. There's other applications, 311 applications, community reporting kind of data that that's probably very appropriate. At, yeah, you know, for 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 collating and, and collecting um, on that one. Yeah, that and that's the big thing with with artificial intelligence, right? It's it's all about the decision of whether is art of, is AI or machine learning an appropriate solution for the problem. Yeah. and 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 it takes a very it takes a very uh, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for here? I can't remember. But it's it's it, it an organize for an organization to say we're not going to go into that space right now takes a lot of discipline because it's it's an attractive space to be. There's a lot of investment in it. There's a lot of talk about it. But like you said, it's not always the best solution. And you're right. There there have been ex- use cases in the states where companies, uh, consulting companies or companies in general, have used AI in a very unethical manner. And I think it was it, it was a major insurance company in the States. Uh, I won't say who they are, it doesn't really matter, but they were using artificial intelligence for some of their marketing. And yeah. it it kind of bit them in the in the butt. I can't remember exactly, but you're right. So cool, yeah, that's, that's good, but interesting discussion. Are you at all involved? I know like there's the Alberta Internet of Things association uh-huh. and they i know like there's the uh, alberta machine intelligence institute like there's a lot of these groups popping up do you work with them at all or keep keep an eye on what they're doing or any involvement we we, we more track what they're doing you track um, what they're doing yeah and, you know so we're feeding off of them as opposed to feeding them right um you know so yeah. more of a uh, in a in a reactionary mode because right. you know even though we may not want to repurpose user data I yeah. still think there's a, re, a role for, 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 you know, computer-based learning, especially yeah. since a lot of these events are very environmental. 
So yeah. understanding what is the weather going to be like tomorrow in and around this fire. If it's going to rain, maybe we should take this approach. If it's going to continue to be high winds and dry, we need that. Um, tsunami prediction in terms of arrival times is very much a function on yeah. the origins versus um, the, the, the water depth and, yeah. and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so certainly a role. I just, I just think we need to be very conscious about uh, about the other piece. So as a result, we're very much very keen on tracking, um, yeah. you know, those other purposeful technology samples. Um, well, may and, maybe, you know, we, maybe one day we'll have a little Voint alert avatar pop up in my VR headset uh, <laughs> in Edmonton that says, hey, there's a thunderstorm coming. <laughs> you know, we that's something we've always, always, we've been tracking. And when, oh, we, yeah. ran, okay. when, we, when, we, when we monitored that, um, we were responding to an RFP somewhere. And oh, you yeah. learn a lot through through some of these RFPs. Yeah, great great feature ideas in some of them. And um, um, yeah, one of them was was do you have the capability of interacting with a gaming platform for exactly that reason? Okay. And we thought we don't right now today, but this is certainly something that we need to be putting on our roadmap and our, our radar because yeah. you know at any given time on a on a Thursday night you might have five percent of the population plugged into a, an online game of some fashion or another. So. Well, and when you're, when you're in a VR headset, like you're, and you're fully immersed in an environment, like your phone and the outside world, like you do lose track of that very quickly. Yeah, so I, I, I could see that need there being one day for, for a little emergency alert avatar to pop in and say, Hey, take off your headset and, and, and here's the message. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Because you yeah. won't, you know, you're, you're immersed, as you point out. You, you're not going to hear or see anything other than, you know, what's oh, yeah. in your goggles. So, yeah, I did. Uh, I did the National Geographic kayak trip through the uh, the Arctic, and I mean, I love kayaking, and I I thought it was going to be kind of silly, but like it was kind of scary at a little point because they've got ice falling around you and penguins jumping out out of the water at you. And yep. you get, you do get fully immersed into that. So it's, it's, I, I would have, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Even motion yeah. sickness. And yeah. You got to get over the motion sickness. Some, you know, there's some VR headset companies out there. I've debated with, with their developers that, you know, our, our VR headset doesn't cause motion sickness. Well, you haven't had me wear it yet. It, it, there's that little bit of a buildup, right? So just to kind of end off, like where, you know, where do people contact you if if they're because it I think this this talk for me was a great reminder that yes you provide an emergency alert system but you're also a community resource to develop a system that's right for them and and bring them that support to to help with their preparedness which you know I, I think is, is a whole value onto itself. I mean, sure, you bring the software and the hardware to the table, but there's there's a lot you can do for a community. So, you know, where where did where did people reach out to you? I think Voyant. Yeah, it's voyant alertcom Okay. So v o y e n t dash alert.com dot com. and and uh, you know we we like to view it as as a broader community engagement solution. You know, whether yeah. everybody's using it for emergencies, 70, 80% are using it for day to day stuff. And, uh, and it, you know, it, it, it's, it's a variety of everything. Um, and, and you can probably to... like, do, do you have communities that use it also just as an, an internal, like, say, say a system goes down at the town office and it's like, don't show up to work? Like, are you, do you have communities that use it for that business continuity piece too? Virtually all of them. All so of all of them have a have a mechanism whereby they can contact their employees. Um, we have fallback options. So if they lost internet and they needed to communicate with the community, they 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 contact us and we can act as a proxy. You know, I mentioned the oh, yeah. we act as a surge resource. So we act as a proxy for them for creating communications and 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 sending and initiating them okay. from, on their behalf. So cool, great. Um, yeah, that I think that that's that's all good functionality to to recall. Where what is what does Voyant mean? Where did Voyant come from? Where? <laughs> so um, you know, small companies, long histories. Um, yeah. 
So when we originally conceived of OIN Alert, we were looking at it from an enterprise perspective. And the idea okay. about allowing them to build contextually aware systems and, and communication environments. So think of a shooter on campus or an event happening on a university campus. We wanted to be able to direct students in one direction or another, maybe depending on the weather or the temperature. Oh, so, yeah. so it kind of spun off of this notion of being clairvoyant. We're providing you personalized information oh. before you even know that you need it kind of thing. Clairvoyant. So it, 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 you know, uh -huh. there was a little bit of, of that. We kind of felt, well, clairvoyance is a little big brotherish. We don't <laughs> want to go there. Yeah. But, you know, we, we just kind of shortened it up and, and thought we'd really focus on that. You know, how do we convey personalized information in a private setting? In a private ah, I, lo I love story. I love to hear how companies came up with their name. I, I don't know why why it is. Uh, it just it fascinates me. Um, so clairvoyant is part of voyant, which okay, awesome. I love that. So I, that that was the story, and uh, yeah, and highly contentious. I, I learned to stay away from marketing decisions yeah. <laughs> like that because you know they can go on forever and ever when you're when you're talking about this. But yes, this one kind of resonated, and uh, and and we stuck with it at the time. That's that's why you hire someone like Lauren to to yeah. uh, guide you through that process. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, no. Um, well, I you know I I I hope we covered a lot of ground. If you're still with us and and you got something out of this, uh, thank you, thanks, Pauline. Yeah, it's a I I love hearing these these Genesis stories. Or I'm a big comic fan, so I like the origin story uh, idea. But uh, thank thanks for sharing that. Um, the, again, if you're, if you're still with us, if you've got a quick question, submit it through now, cause we're almost going to sign off, but we will have this uploaded onto YouTube and out there in the coming weeks. And I'll throw around some clips. So, uh, Brian, I want to thank you very much, much for doing this live, live shows are always, you know, a little, for me, they're always a little scary. I had a power outage this morning. I woke <laughs> up to my power being out. Uh, at at eight eight thirty in the morning, and I was starting to sweat at about nine fifteen, because uh, my backup system is only good for twenty minutes. And I'm like, oh no, I can't cancel the live stream. But we're all good. So thanks for doing this. Not a problem. Thank you very much for having us. It was a blast. You're you're very welcome. So I'll get you to hang on a, a quick sec before we go. I, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. Again, we've got public speaking. For Dummies, author Allison Connolly coming up on, on here, Autism Canada, uh, Kent Letander. We're going to be talking Indigenous policy. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And if anything, stay connected.